I'll introduce you to Mike Seidenberg, who's the portfolio manager for the Alliance Technology Trust. Mike joins us today from San Francisco. It's a very good connection uh, and he's just finished his breakfast, so uh, I'm sure he's feeling good to go. So welcome, Mike, to your first ShareSock webinar. I hope we'll see you again sometime, but uh, well, first I'll all, hand over to you at this stage and I'll pick up with the Q&A later. Thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for having me as a representative of the team. I appreciate it. You're um, welcome. Great. Uh, so why don't we just go to the presentation. Um, which I'm gonna share my screen um, and grab it right here. Okie doke. Um, well, first of all, uh, for those of you that voted, I uh, appreciate uh, your support. I was uh, very pleased to see uh, the percentage as high as it was. Um, so I'm just gonna go through some quick uh, slides over the next kind of 20, 25 minutes, and then we can open it up to Q and A. So, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm one of the portfolio managers on the Allianz Technology Trust. Uh, I hope uh, that it, in the near future, uh, we can take off the uh, COVID mask on our robot, uh, but near, for, for right now, it's still on. I, I, think, I think we're very close. Um, uh, and uh, sorry, I was just making sure the page down works. Great. Uh, so, you know, Allianz, uh, the technology portion of, the, uh, of Allianz Global Investors, collectively manages about $31 billion. Um, it's headquartered in San Francisco. It's composed of, um, of two distinct teams um, uh, and we'll get to our team later, but I think that the, the, the focus here on this slide is just to let you know that we collaborate every day uh, with the people on this, uh, you know, represented here. Uh, we share meetings. Uh, we uh, were on calls together, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sometimes we get to different conclusions, which um, those of you in the investment world know, um, you know, that that happens. But it's a very, it's a very important portion of our uh, of Allianz Global Investors business, and it's a growing portion of the business. Uh, just kind of given the relative importance of tech and kind of what it means. Uh, going forward to many companies. Um, the, the team I work on is a team of five. Um, we collectively manage approximately $13.5 billion. Um, uh, uh, of, of the team um, that's all, then we're all located in San Francisco, uh, three out of the five of us actually have domain expertise uh, in technology. Uh, myself, uh, uh, prior to working on the buy side, which I joined, and uh, in September of 01, I worked at Oracle Corporation doing a variety of stuff for them um, and then worked at a startup during, during the dot-com. Um, so, uh, I, you know, uh, 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 Wa Chen worked at Intel at, at, at one point in his career and Danny Su uh, worked at Booz Allen consulting back to techno technology companies. I often joke that, you know, uh, we're a team that really are, you know, for lack of a better word, pretty geeky group of people. Uh, we, uh, we really love technology. We love to understand how the products work. And we think that that's just germane to our process. As you see here, you know, there, we, we have our team, we have uh, grassroots research, which I'll talk about later, but that's a primary research source uh, that we use extensively uh, for just questionnaires for talking to buyers and users of technology. And then obviously we have the Allianz Global Investment Platform uh, supporting us, um, uh, you know, augmenting our research process. Um, we think our process is really a, a competitive differentiation, um, differentiator for our investors. Um, you know, if I take, take a step back and just kind of think about how we think about uh, uh, investing in technology, we really think about, you know, that th 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 this is, a winner's game, not a loser's game. And what do I mean by that? I mean that that in technology, um, in let's just use software, for example, you see items that used to be included in a budget and now actually are line items in that CIO's budgetary spend. So for example, in my career, um, if I think about security, which those of you who've kind of, you know, Cybersecurity. For those of you who've been reading the newspapers regarding the Ukrainian and Russia situation, there have been just a lot of talk about cybersecurity and cyber warfare. Um, you know, if I think about security, security used to be part of the software budget, but now security 
um, is its own line item, right? And what does that mean? That means that these companies are gonna garner dollars year after year as that becomes increasingly important to the CIO. And I would argue, I would argue in securities case, um, and we saw a great stat uh, recently, I think Palo Alto Networks in their last quarter talked about the number of boards that are now um, forming uh, uh, cybersecurity kind of uh, committees at the board level. So that just kind of tells you that cybersecurity is, is this trend um, that is that is real that is garnering more dollars but the idea that you know finding company finding sub segments within a budgetary line item and those become their own line items right um, and that's what we mean by a winner's game um, that, that, that as technology progresses there are just no, more and more opportunities uh, for these for these subsectors to emerge and if you think about it on the semiconductor side of the house um, which is obviously a, a, you know not software um, you have situations where you think about like electronic vehicles and you think about the amount of semiconductor uh, se semiconductor content that is going into those relative to a combustible uh, automobile. Um, I think that the stat is approximately three or four X the amount of content goes in an EV compared to a traditional car. So, you know, the idea that, you know, creating these subsectors within within technology really results in just great opportunities over time to invest. Um, you know, one of our uh, core philosophies is really to understand and invest in what we feel like are the best management teams. And the reason why we think that's important is A, the amount of share garnered by the number one and two players in a given seg sub-segment is usually, um, uh, is usually pretty uh, substantial, but more importantly, we want to mitigate the blow up risk, right? Because you do have a rate of change issue uh, in, in investing in this industry. And we think that, you know, spending time getting to know management, focusing on management and really understanding their path um, is really important to mitigate that blow up, blow up list. Look, as, um, as portfolio managers, we're really focused uh, on subsectors from a risk perspective as well. So we think it's really important to be diversified within our fund, not only by a stylistic perspective, but also from a subsector perspective, right? So you don't have, you know, this, uh, you, you don't have all of your, all of your investment kind of predicated on, for example, semiconductors, you may have it spread throughout a variety of sectors within technology. Um, as I alluded to earlier, um, you know, we use grassroots research to really augment our process. Uh, I'll give you a great example of how we use them. And, and it's just so you know, Grassroots Research is an independent organization within, within Allianz, and they really are composed primarily of ex-reporters and ex-people that used to, you know, kind of write stories and whatnot for newspapers. Um, but they go out and they talk to people. So for example, um, about seven years ago, uh, we were looking at Netflix, and one of our thesis was that people that were buying iPads at the time we're actually going to subscribe to Netflix. So we did a survey. Um, they went out and talked to people as they were leaving um, Apple stores um, to ask them a series of questions. And they came back with, they came to us with the results. And that allowed us to gross that position up, right? It allowed us to have more conviction in our thesis around streaming being the future for Netflix. Um, and at the time, you know, that was a really nascent part of their business. So uh, we, we use grassroots. It's an important part of our process. Um, you know, I think it's worth noting as technology has become a larger portion um, of, 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 sorry, of, of the S&P 500 and of industries, you're seeing more mature segments, right? You see segments where you have a lot of the traditional behaviors occur, um, and, and that allows people like that activists to get in there um, and to kind of force return to capital um, it, 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 it results itself um, a number of years ago, if you take a look at the, at, the, at the DRAM space, which is a component of storage, there were four players, or sorry, there were five players that consolidated down to three players, and the behavior from a pricing perspective was much better for investors, i.e. there was less capacity, therefore um, the pricing of their product held up better and the net result was shareholders made more money. So the maturity of segments of technology also affords us opportunities um, uh, with, you know, to, to, to look at both you know, growth sectors as well as value sectors, which we think is really important. Look, if there's one slide 
in this presentation um, that I really think really speaks to us. And if I only left you with one about our fund, this is the slide. Uh, this is kind of our, our process. This is how we think about um, creating uh, identification of the investment opportunity all the way through creation of a portfolio. So, so what do we do at our core? Well, you know, like a lot of like a lot of people, we listen, right? We spend a lot of time listening to calls, whether the, uh, those calls are with CIOs, system integrators, um, companies. That, obviously, at times and prior to prior to COVID, uh, we went we spent a lot of time at trade shows, literally walking the floor, talking to customers at user groups. And our kind of core belief here is that you know by listening and understanding what's happening in the industry you kind of see where the ball might potentially be going. And that creates ideas for kind of what are these growth trends, right? And once we identify the growth trend, uh, for example, like whether it's a, a security, um, you know, then, you know, which we used to go to the RSA show, which is the big security show, but we would walk around the floor and we would say to ourselves, you know, this is so confusing if I were a customer. Um, and we basically kind of came to the thesis that really this, this industry needed to consolidate, consolidate. And therefore the player that was gonna consolidate the security industry in this example really was gonna garner lots of dollars. So, you know, listening and then moving on to kind of looking at the business models. Um, look, you know, I'll, I'll tell everybody on this call, um, you know, just because a company is public doesn't mean it's a good business. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you want to ask yourself as an investor, what are the barriers to entry in that segment, right? Because barriers to entry provide op uh, operating margin potential. So we really kind of drill down and look at sectors. Um, uh, and when, when that often results in our, our in actually kind of walking away from an opportunity just because we can't get the risk reward to work work for our investors, but we, you know, we then look at the, look at the, at a company level, figure out which company has the best operating model, and then kind of go through the diligence of really understanding uh, what is the value, what is the risk reward, um, and then, you know, the next portion of the journey, which is where the owl is, would be that kind of what we call, you know, that, you know, relationship building, right, four times a year, companies report earnings, um, you know, we uh, we go visit management teams. We go talk to customers. We really want to understand what is the competitive advantage. What are ancillary products they're thinking about bringing to market, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and we think that this gives us kind of a, not only conviction, but it allows us the opportunity. Should a company have subpar results, to really ask yourself, okay, is this a one-off? Or is this a thesis changing event? And if it's a thesis changing event, uh, because it's really important to back test your hypothesis in this business, then that really gives us kind of gives us the ability by knowing the company as well to say to ourselves, look, we were wrong. You know, um, this industry is more competitive than we thought, and therefore, you know, we may need to exit this position. So, and, and throughout that throughout this journey. You know, the whole, the whole idea at the end of the day is to create a portfolio and a portfolio that is diversified, a portfolio that is diversified by style, by market cap, um, and by various subsectors. Relate, uh, uh, so we think that's important. So this slide to me really speaks to kind of how we do our job uh, on a daily, weekly, slash yearly uh, basis. So just a few minutes about just the team. Uh, you know, the two senior portfolio managers have worked to, have worked with one another in excess of 30 years. Um, most of the team has, uh, you know, the rest of us have 15 to 20 years worth of investing experience. And I would say that, you know, the, the process on our team is really almost a Socratic method where we believe in individual accountability at a stock level. So when that when Microsoft reported last night, I knew that Microsoft was my responsibility. And when I talked to my teammates um, at the end of the day after they reported and after the call was over, we talked about Microsoft and we talked about kind of what we were going to do. But understanding that my job as the primary person on a name is really to build advocacy and build and to is to 
basically bring my partners in to understanding why we should own this company and why, why it should potentially be a bigger portion of our portfolio. So there was a lot of, a lot of um, discussion back and forth. Um, it's very lively. As you can imagine, with five individuals, everyone approaches things in kind of a different way from, a, from an investment perspective. And your job is really to make sure that, you know, a, a, is to, a, to gross up a position is really to convince your peers um, why we should own more. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, diversified across industries and market cap, um, about 50% of the product uh, derives its revenues outside of the US. Uh, so it's global in nature. Look, traditionally, um, as you saw on the previous slide, our style really lends itself to understanding these kind of these companies that go from mid cap to large cap, right? These themes and technology that emerge, whether that's a cloud cloud computing um, be, becoming more main mainstay, or whether it's something like um, you know uh, semiconductor content content and electronic vehicles. Our process really helps us identify those companies that we think can go from you know being a mid cap company to a larger cap company. Um, and, that, and that's really the ability to, inter, to, to identify secular winners, right? Because the one thing that I often remind myself is that secular companies tend to play out longer and harder than most investors uh, realize. So understanding how to look for that framework and to be a part of that journey. Um, fund, we're very much, as I uh, kind of alluded to, um, we're very fundamentally, fundamentally oriented, but it's really a mosaic, right? I mean, it, it's listening to not only the company, but suppliers, customers, et cetera, et cetera. And then looking at the models and saying, you know, how are we different than Wall Street? What, what's our differentiation from a model perspective as we make that investment? Um, we think being in San Francisco is an advantage given the access to companies. And, um, you know, we also spend time talking to private companies as part of our process, but we don't invest in that, invest in them. Look, the, the net result is robust performance over a multi-decade -de uh, time frame for us. Um, you know, uh, you know. Here again, thinking about the portfolio as a three-tiered cake. You have these high growth innovative companies that tend to be over investing in sales and marketing. Many of the models are subscription, so they're even penalized even more. And therefore, a lot of times they're actually losing money near term as they build up their business. You have Garpy companies um, that are kind of long, or further along in their journey, not growing as quickly. Have a, have nice profitability streams, and then you have kind of value value based stocks, right? Stocks that maybe it's a mature industry that has a product cycle. Maybe it's a company that is is at maturity, but actually bought a bought a division of someone else that affords them the opportunity to kind of grow their business again. So really thinking about you know the different styles of companies within the tech within the tech framework and understanding how they fit in a balanced, you know, balanced portfolio. Um, this slide really speaks to uh, just kind of, you know, what we've seen in technology, um, you know, as technology has become an increasingly part of almost every industry um, in the last 10 years, you're seeing that, that there has been some expansion of tech vis-a-vis uh, vis the S&P 500, but I'll tell you, it's not the dot-com, right? Where you had a bunch of companies who really weren't solving very difficult problems and really didn't have products. I mean, I worked in that time frame, So I think it's important for investors in a volatile time period to really think about technology and how it impacts their lives and the companies they do business with. I thought, you know, Microsoft really summed it up well last night on their conference call when the CEO basically said, you know, we are, you know, we are part of the digital transformation that companies are having to go through coupled with this kind of labor shortage that we're seeing as to how to make investors more productive. And I think that that's an overarching theme for a lot of companies in this space. So if you take a look at this, um, uh, this particular slide just, just kind of talks about the, the, the replatforming that many companies are, that, that, are, that, that is, sorry, <laughs> the replatforming that is occurring today. Um, you know, I think COVID even made it more important for many of these companies really to understand that they need to do business digitally and they need to do business in a modality where they really mitigate some of their costs. Um, and moving to the cloud, it really helps facilitate that. And COVID really uh, created this kind of have and have nots 
uh, situation for many companies. So we think that, that trajectory continues. It's about a $1.7 trillion spend opportunity uh, over time. You know, this really just speaks to um, uh, just kind of what's happening today, showing you the journey of, from mainframe to artificial intelligence. Look, I like to remind investors because you hear words bantered about like artificial intelligence. And at the end of the day, that really just means the ability to have cheap compute and storage and really and run algorithms against that in order to kind of help companies optimize data and get answers from that data. I say, you know, at Oracle, we knew the questions to ask when I worked there, the problem was it was just too expensive to 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 put the to put the data in proprietary storage systems and to run the compute. So I don't I don't want people to be intimidated by artificial intelligence. Just think of it as these massive data sets that that companies can very easily um, extrapolate uh, answers to by running lots of different different algorithms against them. This is a. Uh, our uh, performance over time, um, you know, uh, look, we had a tough year last year, um, you know, not something uh, we were happy with. Um, over time, you know, we've done a good job for our investors. We have a long multi, multi-year slash decade, decade track record with this particular product. Um, and I think the reason why it's done well is, you know, we've been through tough tech cycles before, um, but we've always weathered the storm and, and, been, and have been able to really identify kind of what is, what, what is happening in technology. Um, uh, so this just kind of shows you um, the, you know, this slide just, you know, we underperformed due to our underweight of the mega caps. I think it's important here um, to kind of highlight the fact that um, we have a very active board uh, with this product um, and they're very acutely aware of position sizing um, and therefore even, you know, even, even if the, uh, we would never be benchmark um, weight in the mega caps, they're just too large a portion of our benchmark. So that's something we just have to deal with. And on a yearly basis, um, you know, I like to tell our investors we are benchmark aware, but we are mar not benchmark driven. Um, uh, some of the higher growth uh, companies uh, hurt our performance um, as well. A company like Okta and Security and Paycom. Some of the companies that helped our performance last year, Security, Zscaler. Uh, Z uh, uh, Zscaler is a uh, security company. Tesla. Some of the semiconductors on semiconductor Seagate. Um, and we were, were underweight China, which traditionally has been a, uh, a sector where we invested uh, in uh, aggressively over time. Um, Walter and Wa Chen started in, in China in 2002. So it's a sector where um, we, 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 were early to, we were early to enter that space and we were uh, quick to get out of it over, we got out of it probably three -ish years ago because we didn't like the current government and how how they were treating investors. Um, we'll relook at it when we feel like the playing field is clear to us. Just a quick shot, a snapshot of our top 10 holdings. You'll see it's pretty, it's a very diverse um, group of holdings. You have, you know, uh, you have value stocks like a TSMC, which is a semiconductor, Taiwan, sorry, Taiwan Semiconductor Company um, on semiconductor. Um, and you have some higher growth companies in the likes of a Zscaler and a Tesla and then Microsoft, which I would describe as a Garpy company. So I think this is a good amalgamation of kind of, of kind of what, you know, kind of what our portfolio looks like. And you can see it's not really biased one way or the other. Um, you know, semiconductors has, has been a larger portion of our portfolio right now. We started moving the portfolio out of higher growth names in the summer. Um, obviously, we didn't do enough, uh, but uh, we, we saw that we just couldn't get the risk, to, risk reward to work on some of these names. So we started moving our portfolio towards more value oriented sectors. Just kind of shows you distribution um, of the portfolio. Not surprising, uh, you know, we tend to have overweight and mid cap and large cap and underweight mega cap just due to some of the benchmark issues. And obviously our process really lends itself better towards mid cap, large cap. It's a concentrated portfolio, 65 names uh, compared to the benchmark. Um, you know, we're really focused on kind of what does earnings growth look like as we go out in time and really kind of understanding that even though if our core PE is higher than our 
benchmark our earnings growth over the next kind of next 12 months is is, is far superior and we think and we're willing to pay up for that um, if you kind of if you take a look at the snapshot there so what are some things we're excited about you know kind of post hybrid uh sorry post uh COVID, you know, I think collaboration is going to be increasingly important. I think it's very difficult for companies to uh, to get work done in a hybrid environment. So we're looking at coll collaboration, uh, collaborative collaboration software. We're looking at you know things that I alluded to earlier: electronic a lot electronification of vehicles, making manufacturing more important, more flexible. You know, many of these countries really want to have competitive workforces. That's going to require automation. That's going to require lots of uh, manufacturing um, solutions that help on auto, uh, help make people more productive because our cost of labor is so high in a country like the UK, the United States. Um, thinking about, you know, cloud computing and these data centers and what goes into those. Um, so we think, you know, this is a rapid period of change for technology, uh, but I do think technology is creating um, competitive advantages in every industry that that, that, that that embraces it. And then it probably provides a really good growth opportunity depending on your time period over the next couple, next couple of years. Uh, you know, we're aware currently that, that the interest rates have really put pressure on the higher growth companies. And we can talk about that in Q&A, uh, but we think over time that, you know, technology probably can, can provide investors with some of the both best absolute and relative returns. Um, and we're very bottoms up oriented. So I can pause there. I know um, there, there needed to be that we wanted to do some Q and A. Um, you, know, I, you know, one of the things, and I'll just go through these really quickly before Mike comes back on, but just thinking about global labor uh, shortage and what that means to, to companies over time and what you see historically on this slide is as we deal with labor shortages, usually companies offset that by investments in technology um, and that creates good opportunities for companies. By the way, changing um, your kind of growth rate from a labor perspective takes, you know, decade, it takes a decade or half a decade. It's not something that happens overnight. So those are, you know, that's kind of us in a nutshell. I'll toggle back and forth uh, to the slides as we do Q&A, but uh, thanks for your time and I uh, appreciate your support and I'm happy to take Q&A. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, that's a very quick run through. I'm sure we've got plenty of questions actually. So uh, I'll start with the, uh, the most popular first. Um, sure. This one's from Andrew Latu, who, who, Latu, who's been quite productive actually. There's a lot of Andrew Latu questions here. How is ATT dealing with the current sell-off? Uh, yeah. ATT appears to always have net cash. Would it always avoid financial gearing? So there's a couple of questions in there, really. Yeah. Uh, so look, as I alluded to, you know, we, we for a lot of the names, we just couldn't get the risk reward to work um, in the summer, uh, and therefore we started positioning the portfolio more towards value. And as you saw, we had you know a large semiconductor waiting. Look, you know. We're still uh, optimistic about things like security, which just have really good growth drivers behind them. Um, we're choosing more wisely on some of the more digital transformation oriented names. But I would say that, you know, we've adjusted. Clearly, we didn't adjust enough. And look, I think one of the surprising things for us has been that this interest rate rise, the, rate, the, the rising interest rates has been fairly well telegraphed uh, over the past, call it, you know, Seven to ten months, yet the yet the markets really kind of you know, digested it in a very short time period, um, and obviously that's been challenging for us. Um, and it's something you know we're working our way through. Look, I think that once the market digests, you know, once we kind of have a more normalization of kind of what that feels like, I think you will see investors turn back to to you know you know so these these themes like digital transformation like movement to the cloud, these are multi-year journeys. And, uh, you know, here again, I, not to quote Microsoft too much, but, you know, I just thought he did such a good job last night of talking about the demand drivers that they're seeing, which we are really participating in for many of our investments, which is, you know, you just can't 
cut off the spigot, right? Once you decide to move in that direction, you need to replatform. You need to basically do business, whether that's business to consumer or business to business, you need to do that digitally. I mean, think about you know everyone on this call, think about your own experiences as to how you interacted with businesses during COVID. You know, you probably, my guess is you ended up spending more money with companies that you could interact with digitally, um, whether that was ordering food or ordering, you know, groceries, you know. So I, I do think that, you know, we're still early in the process of doing that. Yeah, um, uh, so, you know, we think that people come back to some, come back to the names. It may not be as broad based as it was. I do think the market's got, you know, a little euphoric. Um, and, you know, I often remind myself, you know, find companies that solve difficult problems where there's lots of pain. I um, mean, that's one of my, my germane ways I think about going, you know, about, about thinking about investments. To answer your question about gearing, um, you know, we are, the, we are allowed to use gearing. We've never used it before. Um, our core belief is that technology is volatile enough. And if you add gearing to the equation, you probably even get a more volatile product, but it's a, it's a fair question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, perhaps an adjunct to that, I don't know, portfolio turner is, turnover is very high uh, within the trust and uh, yeah. apparently it's over 100% in most years. Uh, this seems like a lot of trading. Does it add value and what is the reason for it? Sure, we, you know, so first of all, we're not really, the, the, the trading is really positioning, uh, uh, position sizing changes not necessarily exits and entry. So, you know, we adjust accordingly. Um, you, know, you know, we're active bottoms up managers. Um, and, you know, I don't feel like, I mean, I don't feel like our, our um, turnover for the sector is any higher than our peers. I mean, maybe some of the other ones that are really kind of benchmark, much more benchmark aware might would have a lower turnover, but I, it's not trading in and out of names. We're not buying a company today you know, letting it go down, sorry, letting it go up 20%, you know, uh, and then selling it. That's just not what we do. I think it's really more of a function of, of just kind of weightings that kind of change periodic, periodically. All right. Okay. So it's, it's primarily driven by sort of rapid changes in weightings that might occur. Exactly. The I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. It's not, it's not entry and exit. It's primarily just changes in weights where, okay. where, where we just can't get the risk reward. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tesla was the biggest winner for the trust in 2020 and the second lar largest position at year end. Uh, now it was sold down in uh, the first half of 21 and is now in the is the second largest position again. Uh, why has there been so much trading in the one stock and why is there upside on the US one trillion dollar electric car maker? Yeah. Um, so first of all, you know, uh, Tesla. Uh, Tesla is a name where uh, Walter has kind of, you know, been, has kind of understood the story since day one. He really had a differentiated view. Um, there have been times during that journey where he really felt like, you know, the stock, you know, either for financial reasons or for unit, uh, so unit reasons that, he, that we needed to kind of trade, trade out of it. Um, look, I, I, the reason why it's a large position today is they, as they, approach scale at so many units of so many aspects of their business, they're going to be able to cost down their bill of materials. They're building factories in Berlin. They're building uh, a battery factory in, in, in Austin and in China. And I think investors, are, I think the, the, the common way to look at Tesla is to look at, it, at an automobile as a combustible engine bill of materials. But I think what people underappreciate is because this is a vertically integrated company, um, they are taking costs out of the product as they're improving it. So the net result is gonna be just, um, a, from a gross profit perspective and a unit basis is, is gonna shock investors. Look, you know, I, uh, and, I was, and I was, uh, we were talking about the other day, they took 40 welds out of the, uh, out of the body of the car in the latest version. When you start doing stuff like that, you take down, you know, your cost of your cost of manufacturer decreases, your reliability increases. Um, the other thing about Tesla that's really interesting from our perspective is the halo effect of the brand and what it means to their used car market. I mean, if you take a look, most of us who buy our car today, you know, you immediately think in terms of 
your depreciation off the lot. Now, right now might be a little bit of a one-off because there's such so scarcity of cars, but generally speaking, uh, you know, cars depreciate quickly. Teslas are holding their value. So we think that creates a really unique opportunity for Tesla, not only on the pricing side with their ability to raise prices, right? Because if I think, if I know that my car is worth more in seven years, then it, you know, sorry, compared to a combustible car, I'm willing to pay a higher price. So we think it's a combination of ability to price better, coupled with units, coupled with profitability. That's really the Tesla story. As, you know, and with the backdrop of electronic vehicles really becoming mainstream, right? I mean, I saw yesterday, I was, uh, happened to be walking and I saw the new Mercedes-Benz electronic vehicle, which looked great. Um, it's called like E450 or at any rate, uh, but it made me think like, wow, these really are becoming mainstream. And look, I think having more, more products in the market is, is a good thing for Tesla, right? Because more products means more people are really seeing this as a mainstream product. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, many other trusts have a, a lag after the period before the performance fee can be awarded to the investment managers. Uh, for Worldwide Healthcare Trust, for example, it is a 12 month period, uh, but um, Alliance Trust has no period upon which outperformance has to be maintained to be awarded the fee. Uh, is this a fair approach for uh, the investors? Well, the way I think about it is we don't get, so, you know, first of all, we, ha um, we, have, to, uh, we have to make up our underperformance before we get compensated on any outperformance. So, I mean, we have a high watermark issue, high watermark like all funds okay. do. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I have been privy to lots of discussions with the board who is acutely aware of shareholder interests. I mean, you know, from my perspective, making back the high water mark, um, you know, probably puts us all in the best position possible going forward. So I'm, I'm not so sure that, you know, uh, you know, if I, I'd have to think about just kind of, you know, holding off performance for our team you know, for an additional 12 months, um, you know, I, I think that we're, we're all in alignment by making up that, that the, 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 you know, the, the high watermark, uh, you know, and that really, that kind of level sets everything, in my opinion. Uh, okay. Now, there's a, there's a declining number of trusts that offer performance fees. It's one of the things that we, we believe doesn't really correlate very well with performance and uh, uh, maybe it doesn't incentivize performance necessarily. So there's no evidence or little evidence of that. So it's a, one of those things that we at uh, Share Soccer often uh, quite, uh, and our members obviously are quite keen to look at. So hence the reason for the question, I suspect. Um, how does an, an active fund like uh, ATT uh, add value over a passive tech fund? And uh, uh, Andrew Latu's uh, mentioned, for example, LNG, Global Tech Index Trust as a comparator. Uh, and I, I don't honestly know the uh, comparative performance over the past few years, but maybe you could, could answer that one. Yeah, I mean, us. I think it really speaks to, you know, the presentation and the process, right? By investing in active managers, you're, you're saying to yourself in a sector like technology, uh, I want to invest in people that are gonna find the secular winners. And those may be represented in an index, but they're not going to be um, represented in a percentage that is probably, you know, differentiated uh, by definition, right? So I think you're investing in a team, you're investing in the process, and look, you know, um, uh, you know, we don't need to go back to the pro uh, to, to to the presentation, but if you take if you look if you take a look at our, you know, if we since this is you know a long you know, focus on long term investing, if you take a look at our five and ten year uh, results. It really speaks to speaks to active management. Yeah, thank you. Um, you talk about the different styles of companies and uh, high growth pre-profit versus growing with good profits and, and cash flows. How do you assess whether or how much to invest in a pre-profit business? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we look at the the opportunity, kind of what's the total addressable market for that opportunity, understanding as the questionnaires uh, articulately put, that it's gonna be unprofitable, right? By, by definition for many of these companies that are subscription models, you're incurring the costs at time of sale, yet you're only recognizing a sliver of that revenue. 
And you add to that the fact that many of these companies are over-investing in sales and marketing in order to build up that moat, right? Um, so what we really look to is like, how, A, how big is that opportunity for that initial product? B, can they sell and can they sell an incremental product um, when they go to renew that subscription, right? Because on that subscription renewal, you have a decreased cost of sales coupled with the opportunity to either expand users or expand products. And in, in, in a best case scenario, you do both, right? You're not only are you renewing at a higher level, but you're adding on to that product. So it really, you know, here again, if you were in a meeting with us, I'm constantly asking management teams, talk to me about your product, your product trajectory um, over the next 18 months, right? Should we expect more new products or less new products? And if so, what are those products? Um, and it's also it, the other side of that coin is really talking to customers and understanding the utility of the product that, that is being sold and, and how happy are they? And I know it sounds kind of corny, but you know, happy customers buy more products from people, especially in tech. Um, so we often think about you know this idea of earning the right to uh, the right for that business to ask for more business because they did such a good job with their first product. But it, you know it, it's definitely a journey. Um, and and if you think about it, like you know if, you know let's just use developer tools for an example, right? You know today there are two hundred thousand open recs for developers in the United States. We are and these are computer software developers. We're minting about thirty thousand a year here, right? So, you know, one of the things we do is we try to identify aspects of technology that really are going to garner tools and technologies to make their job easier. In my developer example, you know, developers have a lot of leeway with products they can use, right? They're in high demand, there aren't enough of them, and they're basically, you know, today's rock stars is what I tell my kids um, as I encourage them to be a software developer, but, you know, really figuring out where these companies play and are they grow? you know, you know, uh, the analogy would be like, you know, back in the automobile day, like, are you, are you focused on the buggy, the, the buggy whips? Or are you focused on the engines? Right. You know, and that's part of our job is to figure out where that opportunity is. Right. Okay. Thank you. Are you still avoiding Chinese tech names on principle or if not, are they uh, offering attractively priced growth after their D rating in 21? Well, the valuation is definitely more appealing than it was. Look, I think one of the hard things for us with with investing in China, and we haven't gone back in there on the investment side, is the fact that you really want to understand the ground rules uh, when you invest in a market, right? Um, you know, and it's not clear to us what the ground rules are, as you have a, a an authoritative authoritarian government regime that really looks at those some of those companies as kind of you know kind of puppets in their in in their game so that's that was really hard for us like our divestment of china was a really big deal especially for those of you who've held the trust for periods of time so you know we're really looking at it i don't think we're comfortable yet um, but you know we'd like to re, you know we're we're believers in uh, the fundamentals of business there, we just want to feel like you, you know, I don't want to invest in a company that, that basically the government decides that they want to put out a business for X, Y, Z reason and have to explain to you, the shareholder, you know, kind of that, that, that is, look, I can explain to you why a company missed, missed numbers. I can explain to you why a company maybe got, you know, competitively displaced. Very difficult to explain to you kind of why a government just decided to do something, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds like at the moment political risk is going to deter you from going Correct. into China. Okay. Um, uh, other fund managers, uh, there's an interesting question, such as Bailey Gifford, for example, say that new companies are staying private for longer and that in, uh, in the tech space, fund managers need to be connected to the, the VCPE networks to exploit those opportunities. Um, now that goes against obviously your 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 philosophy at the moment. But what is your view going forward on that? Are you going to miss out a lot of growth opportunities because you are primarily focused on the public markets? So, so I think there's been a disconnect between public and private during the cycle, and that you you know at times you've seen companies go public at valuations less than their 
than their than their than their than their last round privately, although not so much in the last eighteen months. It was a little bit earlier. Look, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we will have relationships with these companies, um, uh, and it's something that you know our tenure um, affords us. And we, you know, for example, we were talking to Facebook. You know, they actually called us to to, to speak to us prior to going public. Um, so we have really good we have good relationships. It's just, you know, if I think about the private market aspect of the business, I feel like it's very much a, a different type of ball game. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, as much as it's difficult sometimes to get to understand the valuation when companies go public, which is why we don't participate in most IPOs, um, because we just can't get the risk reward work there. So we do the work, get to know the company. And when we get, when we, if we get a chance to buy that company, we'll buy it when the risk reward makes sense. I think conversely, you know, you know, the scarcity of on the private side creates kind of a euphoria that it's just not it's just, you know, I'm sure Bailey Gifford's really good at what they do. It's just not what we do. Um, so I don't feel like we're missing out uh, because I feel like most companies, the path towards exit is vis-a-vis -vis, uh, public markets. And then once it's public, you know, you as an investor can decide what is the price, you know, where the risk reward makes sense. You know, um, and that, that's just kind of been how we've thought about I thought about it. Okay, thank you. Um, some top 10 positions in your portfolio appear to be very aggressive on the valuation front, uh, for example, Snowflake. How can you be sure there is still some good upside potential there? Yeah, I mean, I, as, the, as the top 10 showed you, it was kind of going back to the idea of this kind of you know, three three tiered cake, right? There are going to be some high growth uh, companies. Look, I think in the case of Snowflake, which just grew over 100% last quarter, um, you know, uh, businesses are building their business on that platform, and that's always a really strong sign for a company that has longevity. Um, you know, you've seen a, a variety of companies literally come out of the ground that that are built on top of Snowflake to to you know, and they're doing different things with the snowflake, uh, with the snowflake data, the, the, the ability of kind of what the product does. So, you know, I look, it's expensive. They're growing fast. Um, they, you know, it's one of the best, if not the best team from an execution perspective. We knew the team when they were at Datadog, we were uh, investors there. We were investors with the team when they were at ServiceNow early. So we believe and, and we, you know, we understand how they execute. But yeah, no, I, I mean, I can't, there's nothing I can say on this call that refutes the fact that it's, it's expensive. We're aware it's expensive, but we think that the, the market opportunity for the company is, 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 is really, really large. Okay, thank you. Um, big tech at the moment doesn't seem expensive, but ATT is overweight in mid caps that look expensive at the moment. Um, so could you talk us through the story as to how you see mid cap exposure adding value given where the valuations stand at the moment? I suppose it's a kind of a link to the last question. Yeah, I mean, look, I and mean, obviously, you know, here again, I'll, 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 you know, we've paired some of our mid cap growth companies Historically, it's been a sector where we've really been able to monetize it. I think, you know, looking back, it, it, it's a function of our process. It's our function of understanding kind of the journey for these companies. Um, and the net result is, you know, you know, uh, a result for our shareholders that, that, that you know, that, 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 are, that, that, that have been driven by that sector at time. It hasn't been 100% driven by that sector. We've made, you know, we, we are very, you know, as the portfolio shows you, I mean, you know, we have a, a large percentage of the portfolio in semiconductors, which are not growthy. Um, so, you know, I, th I think some of it's just a question of, it's a really relevant question at a relevant time. And, you know, it's, it's been painful owning those names near term, but, you know, we have kind of a view on the world that, you know, we've, We've been, we've seen, we've seen lots of tricky tapes before. You know, we've, we've been yeah. through things before. Okay, thank you. Um, right, uh, we've got a few minutes left, so we'll try and crack through these fairly quickly. Um, the one here, uh, uh, just, uh, I think this is asking for a sort of a, a contrast or just talk to the contrast between you and another fund house called ARC. Uh, I'm not familiar with them, but they focus apparently more on the analysis of the trend rather than the analysis of the, comp the individual companies in their fund. 
Um, and he goes on to say, my impression is that ATT is prime on the the analysis of the company and uh, secondarily with the trend. Uh, would that be a fair analysis of your your balance of uh, approach? I think I think we're a mosaic. Um, you know, we often describe ourselves as mosaic investors. So it's it, it is company. It is what's happening in the industry. It's what's happening outside of the industry. Obviously, uh, when you think about things like interest rates. Um, so I think that, you know, we don't operate, we don't overweight any particular aspect of, of our mosaic more than others. Um, but I think that it all really boils down to understanding at a fundamental level, kind of what, a, you know, how are we different than the street from a numbers perspective? And what do we think the risk reward is? Um, and there are a variety of inputs that, that, that um, contribute to that. Um, you know, I've been on panels with ARC. Um, I have the utmost respect for, you know, kind of the way they do things, but it's, it's not the way we do thing. We do things. Um, we have aspects of our process that are similar. And then I'd say we have asset aspects that are, you know, fairly different. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, you referred earlier to blow up risk and its mitigation. Um, <laughs> Saying here, how does how do you define blow up as your share price has dropped thirty one percent in three months? Um, specifically to companies. Yeah. <laughs> any, any views on that, Mike? <laughs> I mean, here again, uh, and it's fair fair question. And you know, look, you know, I can I can I I, I I'm, I'm a big boy, so you know, I, I can handle handle it's a, uh, handle the question. Look, I, you know, we're speaking specifically to management, right? When we think about blow up. We think about, you know, within a given, within an investment in a subsector, just wanting to make sure that we don't expose ourselves to really kind of, you know, terrible uh, decision making by an executive management team, which is independent of the market deciding it's, you know, a terrible sector. Yeah. Uh, okay, understood. Um, Stock based compensation seems uh, to be a huge return headwind for mid cap tech companies. Uh, and uh, how do you think about this? Yeah, so, you know, we think a stock-based comp, which by the way, comes up and we are very active talking to our companies. Um, you know, it is, it is a lingua franca of many of these companies in both tech, biotech, and by the way, it also exists out tech, right? I mean, all you have to do is go look at uh, so, but you know, obviously, tech is a poster child, right? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think it's I think it's an increasingly loud drumbeat for companies. We've seen this through using things like RSUs and not option, uh, other forms of incentive, incentive uh, sorry, other forms of incentives. But you know, it's something we're aware of, and it's definitely a tax. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it isn't a tax on the investors. Having said, that, you know, it is table stakes to. To, to get the best employees and therefore, you know, it's part of the landscape that we deal with um, and we'll continue to voice our concerns and right. back to management teams because at the end of the day, you know, I, 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 a, I believe it is a tax uh, to share to shareholders. Um, but, uh, you know, all we can do is continue to kind of voice it. Um, and I'll tell you that, you know, some of the, you know, the worst uh, stocks, could potentially have the lowest shareholder, you know, lowest stock comp, but you know, it, it's a balancing act, right? You really have to understand that when you're buying a company that has high share-based compensation, that, that that you factor that into your investment decision, as you know, as we do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. We, we're kind of out of time. Uh, there was one here about uh, given the unpredictable nature of technology, how easy is it for active managers to add value? Well, I think you talked to that a little bit in comparison. Yeah, I mean, to I would I, look. I don't, so, the thing I'd say there is, you know, I I think the risk is actually on the index side, right? Which yeah. is, you know, obsolescence because the rate of change is such. You have obsolescence risk um, at an index level where you know, hopefully, an active manager side, you're less you're less uh, exposed to that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, ATT, you're the the only U.S. based tech investment trust in the U.K. is is the ATT one. Uh, does this offer a big advantage over open ended funds? And is there an equivalent U.S. tech investment trust? Um, there isn't a U.S. I mean, we obviously manage a variety of products. Um, you know, specifically, is there a U.S. 
US-based one. US-based um, one, yeah. I mean, we have products that, that look exactly like, uh, similar to ATT. I will tell you, I do think um, the, our, our location is an advantage. I think that, you know, and, and we've talked about that, and I think it affords us really good access. Granted, you know, the access hasn't been so great uh, during during COVID, but I think that, that that'll change. But I, I just think you can't help but be immersed in tech when you when, when you live in, in the Bay Area. And, 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 you know, and therefore, I think that, you know, you do pick up on things that are happening, um, you know, personally, you know, I just love being around developers. So, you know, I literally will go spend time with people just and observe how they work and what products they use and et cetera, et cetera. So you know, I think from that perspective of uh, being here is, uh, is good for us. Good place to be. Uh, well, th thank you for that, Mike. There is one more. Yeah, but it's, uh, it, it's another Andrew Latto question. I think he's had plenty. So I'm going to Andrew, apologies. <laughs> we're going to call it quits at that stage. So uh, uh, many thanks, Mike, for joining us. From I appreciate Francisco all the today. questions. Appreciate the support. Um, really good questions. Yeah. OK, well, we've got some very good investors in our organization. They're, they're really hot. So um, uh, thanks for talking to us. And maybe we can get you in next year or the end of this year or something to see how things are doing when the market's uh, maybe in a little different place to where it is today. So, that would be great. So enjoy the rest of your day, Mike. Uh, take okay. care and Cheers. see you again. Bye for okay. now. Bye bye.